नए रेस का नया कूड़ा यू कैन से इट इन अ वेरी सोफिस्टिकेटेड वे दैट एवरी बुल मार्केट हैज अ न्यू लीडर Now there is a lot of wisdom in that one statement, right? But one of the leaders of the previous cycles was private banks and financials, right? And everybody was overweight. Nifty weight in financials was forty percent. And post COVID, banks have underperformed the Nifty yeah. dramatically, right? And the real leader of the pack has been tech or IT services, right? That's the best performing index, metals. best performing index real But estate these, actually to my surprise real estate real estate yes real yeah, estate yeah, right yeah, yeah. so these are two specialty chemicals these are two three four sectors which kind of showed their hand hello listeners my name is raj singhal and welcome to another episode of breaking investment stereotypes Here we deconstruct world class investors or wealth managers and deep dive into their investing journey professionally personally or both This episode is brought to you by multiply.co where we believe that investing is an ignored life skill Our mission is to create a platform where people can find fellow investors discover investing products and share investing ideas We have now gone live and thousands of users are already part of a vibrant community So do check out our app which is there both on Apple Store and Play Store or simply just sign up on web. I want to give a little guidance on how to use the shows. None of the following should be taken as an investment advice. Please see multiply.co/disclosures for more information. My guest for today is Hiren Ved. Hiren is a co-founder, director, CEO and CIO of Alchemy Capital Management. Uh, with over 25 years of experience in the Indian equity markets and public market investing, Hiren has a long track record of alpha generation over of over 15 years. He has been managing advising funds over a billion dollars uh, across domestic and offshore mandates for Alchemy. As the CIO for Alchemy Capital, he has developed a sustainable long-term fundamental research-based investment philosophy that has helped in delivering consistent and superior long term returns for clients so without further ado please welcome hiren ved hi hiren welcome to the show thank you thanks raj thanks for having me on the show yeah it was a pleasure you know so hiren we'll uh, first start with your uh, personal journey uh, before coming to the market so you know you entered the equity market right as an analyst right after your bachelor's degree from mithi by college so what helped you you know what kicked your love for equity market back then Oh, actually, um, you know, uh, our family has a long history of investing in equity markets, right? I mean, if you come from a typically Gujarati Kachi family, investing runs in the blood, so to speak. And uh, you know, my father is an avid investor, and uh, when I was uh, even younger, uh, probably when I was in school, uh, he used to take me around to these annual shareholder meetings. right it used to be like a festive jambori uh, you know you you go there and uh, uh, you know my dad used to uh, tell me that you know keep quiet and listen to the chairman and and, and try and absorb uh, you know some of the stuff so at a very young age i kind of got indoctrinated listening to the business leaders and chairmen who you would stand up and you know give the vision of their companies and update on the companies right and 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 that's where the interest got kindled uh, at a uh, at, at a very young age and then um, you know my dad used to invest in a lot of mnc companies and they used to come up with very colorful annual reports right with a lot of pictures and you know uh, the levers and the coal gates of the world and i used to flip them through and i started to read these annual reports and i got hooked on to it finally i started to collect them and uh, i do remember my Uh, dad asked me what do you need for your birthday and i said can you get me a godrej almari so i can keep all these annual reports uh, <laughs> in, in the place right yeah. uh, so yeah i mean that was that was it and then when i joined college uh, you know the passion grew even more so i would i would spend some time in college and then sometimes i would go to the stock market and spend you know just hang around there and and spend some time uh, there you know going to the notice board in those days the 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 half yearly results used to be pinned on the notice board of the 
stock exchange building so he would go there with a notebook and you know put it down uh, you know write down all the results very quickly and uh, come back uh, and 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 stuff like that and then i teamed up with my accounting professor in uh, in in second year of degree college and we started a stock market game a paper game so we would all being given some money and you know we would report our trades to our professor and then at the end of the uh, and and we ran it for two years right uh, okay. the the sy and ty and then finally uh, you know we had winner so just just deep interest so i was very clear that my calling was the capital was the equity markets so uh, in those days you could do your cost accounting along with your bcom uh, and i finished both those simultaneously and then i went headlong into the equity markets i started my career as an analyst that's how it all started in 1991 so it's been almost 30 plus years now awesome awesome uh, you know uh, uh, people used to i'm sure at those time people used to collect uh, those cricket magazines and and probably when you you were collecting those reports I, that's very interesting. do you do you still have some of those as a as a souvenir or anything <laughs> no now i mean uh, you know for want of space and everything else everything has become digital so, yep. so uh, i had to finally chuck it off uh, <laughs> uh, you know and uh, but i but i but i had them for the longest time right i mean it was you know when people come to your houses you show them some art pieces or whatever yep. i would open the cupboard and show them you know i had put the rubber bands around so 5 6 years of each company's annual reports all together right <laughs> uh, but those were the days of physical paper files and you know cuttings stapled into the annual yeah. report and stuff like so that's that's now no longer required it's too much of a nuisance to maintain so much of physical paper yeah that's 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 interesting so uh, and and then you were uh, heading the equities at prime securities and uh, so what led you start this whole alchemy and uh, with you know getting even uh, uh, rakesh junjunwala who who even then was a very big celebrity as a co-founder so what's the story about uh, alchemy it's actually a very interesting story you know uh, it was actually during my first job at kr choksi and company you know even before prime preceding prime in 91 uh, straight out of college that was my first job in research and and i learned research in a very uh, basic primary way so we were supposed to go and try and attend every agm that we can every pre ipo broker meet you know take uh, tedious notes in the agm and in 91 in september uh, i had gone i traveled to wapi to attend the annual shareholders meeting of united phosphorus which is now called upl right it mm-hmm. was an agrochemical company and i was interested in researching that company so i traveled there and it was in gidc in wapi nobody would actually land up there unless you were really interested so for them it was more of a formality you know few employees gathered and you know they would have probably finished up the agm in 10 15 minutes but there i was there and there were two other young people of almost of my age uh, you know who landed up there who are now my the co-founders and my partners in alchemy lashit and ashwin and they had a similar interest you know very similar profiles you know straight out of college deep interest in the equity markets they also had traveled and trained from mumbai to wapi to attend the agm that's where we became friends and we remained friends up until 99 uh when i decided after working about 4 5 years with kr choksi and another 4 years with prime i said i've had it enough working for other people and i you know the entrepreneurial bug uh, was uh, biting me and then one fine day when you take these career defining decisions you sit with your best buddies in the evening that's when i sat sat with lashit and ashwin and said look i'm planning to quit and i want to start something of my own a portfolio management company i want to manage money you know i had a few relationships and friends and family and you know start with a small corpus and just you know during those couple of conversations the idea hit that why do we not all get together and start a company and 
Mr. Junjunwala was already a, a partner with uh, uh, with uh, Lashita and Ashwin. They already had a broking firm up and running. But I then joined in as the fourth partner, right? And uh, uh, RJ always, uh, you know, you're right that, you know, he was a celebrity investor back then. But he, as you know, that he had a very bullish view on India and India's capital markets. And he thought that he should back young entrepreneurs like us who are trying to do something in the capital markets. And he said, you know, organize yourselves, institutionalize yourselves, form a company. And uh, that's how Alchemy got started. So we already had a broking business. But in when I joined, we started the asset management business as a separate company, Alchemy Capital, with the same four partners. And, uh, you know, today... You know, today we've grown into a large firm, you know, managing over a billion dollars in assets, both for domestic and international investors. Yeah, that's that's very uh, fascinating. And, and, and always good to have uh, buddies for 30 years being your partners as well. So that that's always a uh, great, great thing to have. Right. Uh, let's let's move on to your uh, investing style. Right. I mean, you know, so. Uh, and I'm I'm more deeply interested to understand in those 30 years of being part of the uh, you know markets, and especially managing money for last 22 odd years. Uh, how how has those investing styles changed in in those two decades? Yeah, I mean it's it's been a great learning, and it continues to be a learning journey because uh, you know this is an it's it's a never ending story. You keep. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, learning every time the context and the situation is different, but there are certain principles which which are the same, right? So I give this uh, analogy of a Hindi movie where, uh, you know, it all started by hero and heroines running around trees, trees in Shimla or, uh, you know, somewhere in Kashmir. And then, uh, then you, you do the same thing, but in a very sophisticated manner in New York. And now probably you would be doing it in the metaverse for all you know. <laughs> but the the storyline pretty much remains the same, right? I mean, the, the context changes, the hero heroines change, the villain changes, but everything else remains the same. So I think uh, it, 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 it's been an interesting journey. Uh, to be very frank, the first 10 years, you don't even know what you're doing. You're, you're mm. pretty much excited, uh, you know, looking at companies and, uh, you know, uh, you kind of think you've done all the work. Uh, you are more excited by stock prices than by company fundamentals initially, uh, because that's the kick uh, when you invest small amounts of money and you know make money. But I think uh, even when we started managing money, uh, like you know, every manager you you think that, oh, you know, large caps are not for me. I mean, you know, that's all well discovered. So let's find some very unique companies which can become multi-baggers, right? And, yeah, you know, you, you don't approach the cricket game by saying that every ball is going to be hit by a six. But unfortunately, when you are young and inexperienced, that's how you approach the game, that you want to find so many multi-baggers and you want to be so different than everybody else. Um, so I think... <clears throat> that's how the the journey started but over time you know you realize that uh, there are humongous number of failures when you are trying to invest in small and mid size and unknown companies right and also at that time the regulations were not that great transparency was not that great uh, you know you are trying to uh, make judgment calls on whatever limited information that you have um but I think it was an interesting story. And I think along the way, uh, what we realized was that, uh, you know, one is that th- there are several elements to getting to be, being a successful investor, right? The most important is that the external opportunity for that business has to be very, very big. Um, because only when the opportunity is big, can the company become big, right? Otherwise, you could remain a very small player doing something. Uh, But if you can never scale in absolute numbers, you can never make money, large money in absolute numbers, right? Um, 
So I think the the size of the opportunity is very very important. Uh, you can be you know you can find an odd company in a very small niche area and make money, but you'll never make money over a long period of time because there will always be something which is limiting factor, right? So the the size of the opportunity is big. And secondly, I think that companies go through cycles uh, because of two reasons. One is that the external environment is changing rapidly. And sometimes there are deep cycles and companies get lost in that cycle. Or sometimes companies themselves, managements make mistakes along the way and they fall by the way, you know, wayside. They, uh, they do wrong things. They, they expand at the wrong point in time. They make a stupid acquisition. They do something completely wrong and then they blow themselves up. So one realized that, uh, you know, you needed a lot more elements to fall into place. Uh, you know, the external and the, the external opportunity needed to be big and you needed companies who are very focused and consistent in what they're doing, you know, year after year after year. Um, and suddenly you realize that, uh, you know, very few companies can, can, uh, can make that mark, uh, and that, you know, you cannot predict a multi-bagger on day one when you invest. It's something that you will only realize over a period of time, right? As you watch a company progress over cycles and over a period of time and you see the consistency, that is when you put large amounts of money behind that company, right? So how you size your bets on which kind of companies you size your bets was very, very important. Um, so I think all those understanding of how you size your bets, how you manage risk, even in you know, constant uncertainty and you don't know the outcomes uh, you know, when you are investing uh, is, 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 a, is a very different journey than just researching a company and knowing about a business, you know, finally, how do you make money in a consistent manner? And I think those are some of the learnings that we learned. And, you know, we, I had a ringside view of seeing some of the savviest investors trade and invest, right? Uh, Mr. Rakesh Jinjimbala, Ramesh Damani, uh, Radha Kishan Damani, Nimish Shah. I mean, all these are, are, you know, very, very astute players in the market. And I learned everything uh, a lot from each of these investors, right? Uh, like, for example, uh, when you are convinced, uh, you need to, you really need to bet big when your conviction is high. And when the odds are in your favor, then you don't try to create an equal weight portfolio, like how they teach you in, in theory, right? That, you know, be diversified you know, because diversification reduces risk. And I realized that that's all bullshit. Diversify, you know, uh, diversification does not necessarily reduce your risk. Uh, because if you look at some of the most wealthy people, they've made all their money being uh, entrepreneurs in one company and all the wealth yeah. they've created. In including Warren company. Buffett as well. Including Warren Buffett as well, right? Like yeah. Apple exactly. now constitute probably like 40% of his total 40% wealth. 40% of his portfolio, right? Yeah. yeah. So, so that learning... Uh, you know, I actually brought into my practical life as a manager uh, where, uh, you know, after the first uh, five, seven years of being in business, I launched a portfolio management strategy, which was a very concentrated strategy of just 10 stocks, buying eight to 10 stocks. A typical PMS manager would buy 25 stocks. Many of them go buy 40, 50 stocks, right? It was a complete antithesis of that. And, you know, concentration into strike rate is your friend, right? Yep. And I realized this, that the more, you know, you will reap what you sow, right? So uh, if, you, if you really have a good, good idea, then people would actually pyramid on that idea and put, actually put more capital uh, into that idea. So I think a lot of those finer things that they don't teach you anywhere is something that I learned along the journey. Um, uh, you know, I, I also learned things like, uh, you know, when there were these big cycles and waves, like the tech boom happened, and then the infra boom happened, and the real estate boom happened. And how do you play these kind of 
booms and cycles, right? What I call version 1.0 investing and version 2 investing. Version 1.0 investing is where there is everything is a blue sky. It's a new concept. You don't know how to price it. So you, you know, even if you buy a basket of stocks, you will make money because everything will make money. So in the 97 to 2000 tech boom, doesn't matter what software company you bought, whether it was Infosys or Wipro or Silver Line or Visual Soft or yeah. PSI data systems, you know, all these companies, you made money everywhere. And then something happens in the external environment where there is a meltdown. And then only the few survivors are left, which is what, which I call in my parlance version 2.0. That's the more refined environment where you, you know, only the survivors are left. Right. Um, and this has happened in every industry. Right. So, uh, but you can make a lot of money in version 1.0 uh, in even the wrong stocks. Not that I provided you get them. out. Provided you, get provided you know when to get out of those <laughs> companies, right? Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. like it is, uh, you know, like it will happen now. You know, any company now says EV, yeah. electric vehicles, and the stock will go up, right? Uh, during the heydays of infrastructure, companies used to just announce an order and the stock yeah. market and market cap would go up, right? Nobody really cared what margin is, what is the working capital cycle, whether the guy makes cash flows or not. It was just orders, 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 and market cap. And then, you know, finally we saw what happened to that. The same thing happened in real estate. Oh, I have so many million square feet of, I have this much land and potentially land I can build yeah. so many million square feet of, yeah. uh, of real estate, right? Nobody really mm -hmm. cared whether the market can absorb that, not absorb, what pricing, how much time will it take? Nothing. So, you know, learning about cycles, bubbles, uh, scale, consistency, quality, concentration. I mean, there are several dimensions to invest. In. No, the, I think very uh, well put up on that. Since we are on talking about cycles, and and, and so let me actually uh, dig deeper into the cycle as well. Uh, I, I mean, you know, in in India, I mean, this the, the investing. As you rightly said, right, the tech, then infra, real estate, they all come in cycles. And right now it's all EV. How does one or, or new age tech or whatever, how does one look at cycles, uh, you know, in between you'll have the cyclical stocks like metal stocks doing well or, or sometimes sugar stock doing well. How does one, you know, go through all of this? Uh, is, there a, is, there a, is there a structure to that or it's a little random? No, there is a structure uh, for sure. You know, I think what happens is that when you spend this kind of time uh, in the industry, you virtually end up understanding so many sectors, right? And some become so irrelevant, but then they come back in relevance. Like the classic case in point right now, let's say at least I had long forgotten investing in textile companies. Yep. You know, it's a, you know, industry of yesterday, right? I mean, who knows? Uh, you know, yeah. uh, uh, in the mid mid 80s and probably at that time, you know, they were all, uh, uh, you know, great companies. Uh, but again, I mean, suddenly now with, uh, you know, supply chains being rewired around the world uh, and given the fact that India lost its competitive advantage in textiles to countries like Bangladesh, Pakistan, Vietnam. But I think we are now coming back again. Because, you know, there are cycles even within countries, right? So China is, uh, is giving up that competitive advantage and, 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 you know, India is again stepping in. So one thing is that how to play cycles is to, is to have a good knowledge of history of many sectors. You know, it's good to know and, uh, you know, uh, because you will only uh, know that there is a change in the cycle, especially when it relates to an industry which has been around, like you mentioned, metals, you know, textiles, metals. These are not new industries. They've been around for, uh, you know, decades together. Right? So one is obviously having knowledge, past knowledge, accumulated knowledge back somewhere in, even though it's not, you know, I, I was not investing in textiles or these companies, is, is to have some knowledge. And and then sometimes prices tell you something, right? So we run these screens and over the last five, six years, we, you know, even though, uh, you know, we are very avid, active investors, 
we created a quant team and i'll talk about that a little later but you know started creating a lot of these because now so much of data is available right with computing power and data you can you suddenly find why are textile company stocks starting to do something right and then you go back and check what is happening you make a few phone calls with your old acquaintances and people whom you knew and try to figure out what is happening right so one way is that second is to is is kind of little bit of crystal ball gazing and looking into the future right um and you see what is happening in the environment today uh, how the automotive industry is getting disrupted globally and we saw that and uh, you know initially you think that okay electric vehicles is too far we don't even have the infrastructure uh, in place to do that but then you find that suddenly tesla's market cap is equal to the market cap of the next 10 oems right and you have to look back and sit and then you ponder is it a bubble or is there something happening we need to really figure out what is happening one way to do is to put like an ostrich and you know go down and say oh you know i don't understand this is stupid you know how many cars is he selling he's not even making money how can the market cap be so huge right and uh, and and look at but you know markets have their own wisdom even if there is a bubble a bubble cannot sustain for too long a bubble can sustain for some period of time but it is not a bubble if 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 uh, and and tesla itself has gone through wild swings but at the end of the day it's still a large market cap company no oh, and uh, they are selling million cars right so uh, from yes, five years selling back a million cars and a lot of the hedge funds in the us wanted to short tesla many of them shorted it and despite being an open market and you know large i mean market cap i mean you need to then sit back and ask yourself a question hey what's happening here right and then you start thinking and then you say okay i think in the indian context uh, you know is this going to be relevant and always the, the thing about some of these new age things that you asked is that sometimes you can be too early you won't make money uh and there is always an inflection point that comes right yeah. and you should be able to capture that inflection point and once you capture the inflection point then uh, you need to start uh, figuring out how you want to bet whether you want to bet on one or two people or you want to bet as a basket sometimes things are not very clear so you may want to take a few bets and uh, the way i do it is that when you want to do it that you put small amounts of money in a lot of those ideas and then watch them for some time and then eventually you will figure out which is that uh, one or two ideas that you want to back and once you are convinced then you back up the truck and you you back those ideas right so um so i think that uh, and then you know uh, the, the beauty is that even though i am a fundamental analyst but you know i also interact with a lot of people who do a lot of technical analysis right and 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 there are a few kind of what they call worldly wise wisdom statements that you've heard over the years oh this is after a 10 year breakout which means there is something significant happening which is what is happening right now capital goods as a sector has a long consolidation nothing happened in the last 10 years now suddenly the capital goods companies are you know if you look at the capital good index on the charts you will find that they are breaking out they making after 10 years of sideways they are breaking out it means something is happening the market's telling you something right so <clears throat> the thing about the markets is that you can either approach the market from the company and the fundamentals and then try to predict or you just listen to what the market is telling you prices tell you a story yep. a trend in a certain sector tells you a story you pick up the story then you read between the lines and then you investigate further and that's how you pick some of these cycles right so it's there is no one way if you ask me a structure right but uh, i think uh, working with some of the best tape readers and traders and anal- uh, you know and and this thing is that uh, the market speaks a certain language uh, it's a cryptic language of prices 
you know companies making new what kind of companies are consistently making new highs if you just read through that list of 52 week highs consistently over a period of time you start getting a sense of what is happening right and then very simple things like you know people used to say like very they had a muhavara in hindi said naye res ka naya ghoda hmm. now you can say it in a very sophisticated way that every bull market has a new leader yeah. now there is a lot of wisdom in that one statement right and we utilized it this time uh, uh, in in our strategies in uh, in when covid happened everything fell but one of the leaders of the previous cycles was private banks and financials right and everybody was overweight nifty weight in financials was 40% and post covid banks have underperformed the nifty yeah. dramatically right and the real leader of the pack has been tech or it services right that's the best performing index metals best performing index real But estate these, actually to my surprise real estate real estate yes real yeah, estate yeah, right yeah, yeah. so these are two specialty chemicals these are two three four sectors which kind of showed their hand as the market was recovering from the 2020 lows right naye race ka naya ho raha right hmm. and and we actually went underweight financials when the whole world was saying oh you know financials the great franchises the the, the hdfc is the kotak of the world and we went underweight financials and we went overweight tech pharma you know some of these new sectors that were leading and today 18 months down the line when you look back and see the picture of the market right clearly leadership has changed so every time there is a bear market and you from that bear market is the birth of the next bull market leadership changes and you make a lot of money because a lot of the guys are still sitting with the previous leaders because there is that recency effect in 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 the mind right yeah. uh, so a lot of these subtle things is what we have learned over the years okay that's that's awesome you know so let's let's look at the big picture view on india right so last decade we you know india markets gave return close to about 14% kagar so and so how do you see the next 10 years right while we spoke about the sectors which have done very well post covid but if you want to look at for the next 10 years i mean how do you see a lot of people becoming bullish globally a lot of people talking about uh, uh, us has done very well in the last 10 years versus em so em will do well now india is a big part of em china is also very big part of em but china has underperformed so how do you look at uh, the, this whole you know uh, bigger picture yeah you know typically you have these typical 8 10 year cycles in everything in sectors in developed versus em you know these are just how uh, you know we've learned from these previous cycles and and i think post the global financial crisis uh, the us did phenomenally well right i mean and most emerging markets underperformed um i think within that context uh, i am not an expert to say whether you know there are a lot of my uh, great friends uh, uh, you know who tell me that now is the time where it looks like that many emerging markets will do well uh i i as i said i am not an expert on on other emerging markets but i i do certainly feel that i think india's time has come and i think the next 10 years 15 years should be the golden period for india and there are several reasons for that right i mean uh, it's sometimes the confluence of events that come together uh, you know some are more cyclical some are more long term and structural in nature and first if i just speak to uh, speak about a few cyclical factors the more here and now factors right if you look at the earnings picture in india uh, you know i think we almost had an earnings recession post 2012-13 in india i mean the last time corporate profits to gdp peaked in india was in 2007 uh and uh, you know it's a very interesting chart uh, which i'll send you uh, but i've plotted the 
uh, you know, uh, aggregate corporate earnings to GDP right from March 93. So 92, 93 is the first fiscal year. And it was about 1.3, 1.4%. It was very depressed because we, we had a big economic crisis in 91, right? Uh, when Manmohan Singh came in, then he did a slew of reforms and then earnings picked up and they went from, we went from 1.3% to almost 4% market cap to GDP in 96, 97, right? So we had a cyclical upturn in earnings. And then the Asian crisis hit us. So again, from 4%, by the time, uh, you know, by 99, 2000, we fell back to about one and a half, two percent 2% of GDP. Um, and then from 2002, three, we went from 2% of GDP to seven and a half percent of GDP in 2008, right? Which was the peak of the market. And if you look at that time, Earnings were compounding at 25%. Nifty EPS was compounding at 25% a year. The markets compounded at 25, 28% a year. The, the Sensex went from 3,000 to 21,000, right? We peaked and from there, again, earnings started to trail. And I think we again hit bottom in 2018, 19, 20, right? Again, somewhere in the region of very sheepishly back to that 1.5, 1.6% of GDP. So it's so cyclical, right? But I saw that in the previous two cycles, whenever we bottom out and then we go, we go up 3x. The ratio goes up 3x, right? So I think we hit bottom. And in a year like COVID, which is, you know, 2021, right? Earnings went up by 20% plus. And this year, Again, March 22, earnings will go up another 20, 22%. So cumulatively, we are up 50% in these two years, which were the COVID years, a year which you would have never expected that earnings would grow, but corporate earnings actually revived during the COVID. Right? My sense is that we are going back from two, two and a half percent of GDP back to seven, eight percent of GDP over the next couple of years. And if you do the math, what it tells you basically is that if India's GDP compounds at 12% in nominal terms, so let's say 6, 7% real and 5, 6% inflation, you know, 12, 13% nominal GDP growth. And usually very uncannily, you mentioned 14% the market's given. Usually markets over 10 years, you know, long periods will compound similar to what the earnings have compounded. So I, my view is that the mark, the earnings will now compound in excess of 20% for the next few years. Why? Because of a couple of things, you know, we've seen a massive consolidation uh, across sectors in India. A lot of the unorganized guys have fallen by the wayside. The organized companies have increased their market share. Uh, uh, you know, their profit pool has increased, even though the GDP didn't grow during, during the COVID period, but their share of the profit pool went up. And that's why you are able to see earnings growth, right? And therefore, I think that just cyclically over the next few years, I think that earnings should compound at 20, 25% a year. And therefore, markets should do very well. But that's a more cyclical argument. The more structural argument is that... Uh, if you look at the history of all developing economies which become developed, right? Whenever they cross the $2,000 per capita, right? The next doubling and the next doubling, so two to four and four to eight, happens in the shortest possible time because of the J curve effect, right? Because beyond $2,000, you start saving a lot of money and discretionary spending goes up savings goes up, investments goes up, that starts a new cycle, right? And I think India is at that point where we've crossed the threshold of a $2,000 per capita. And I think the next few years, uh, and this is also coinciding with the fact that we will have the best demographics between now and 2030 or 2032, the youngest population, which is the most active and will contribute to the economy, right? The third thing 
is we are seeing this whole geopolitical disruption and the fact that you know trump started it by becoming anti china but i think covid is also changing a lot of things where suddenly people are sitting back and saying that hey we cannot have everything manufactured in china right because covid really created those barriers you shut down countries you shut down travel you shut down movement of goods and services you can't put all your eggs in one basket right and so uh, for various reasons whether it was the us china tensions whether it was covid i think there is a little bit of deglobalization so to speak not really deglobalization but there is rewiring of supply chains globally that is happening which i think will benefit india uh, because i think india's exports have started to boom again and while you know now software exports are greater than our oil imports yep. uh, also our software exports are greater than saudi arabia's uh, oil oil exports to the world right it's pretty significant that reduces india's macro vulnerability to oil prices uh, you know because india used to always fall back whenever there was these global macro uh, shake ups like uh, you know oil price is going to above 100 dollars you know our fiscal would go completely out of tizzy i think we are a much stronger country with fx reserves our exports are you know very robust we can take these shocks very well at a macro level and another two points which i think are very under appreciated you know uh, people talk about the baby boomers in the us the us really boomed in the 80s and the 90s and that happened uh, the baby boom they call it in the us right their demographics was great but more importantly they built these highways and that increased uh, uh you know uh, the it, it gave a big fillip to the auto industry and movement of goods i think what india has done which is unique is we built the digital highway the india stack right the e, the aadhar the upi the linking of aadhar with the bank accounts and linking of that with the mobile phone right today we have almost 500 people 500 million people in this country who have access to a smartphone and hopefully once the geo phone is launched in in a big way 700 800 million people even a billion people will have access to a low cost smartphone and for many indians the first way to reach the internet is not through the pc but now through the phone right i think with this digital highway that we have built in india right i think that india is going to leap from uh you know just the velocity of money when i used to pay my help at home 3 uh, 4 years ago he would then take 7 days to transfer the money back to his native place where his parents could use that money right just transferring money was a big thing right it used to take such a long period of time today he can zip money the same day right through upi uh which means that they have access to the money the same day which means that they can spend it the same day so the velocity of transactions if you see how we have exploded the, you know uh, upi transactions have just gone through the roof and i think our financial systems are now probably even more advanced than the us and the european banking system right probably only china and south korea may be as advanced so i think this soft digital infrastructure that the government has laid through the npci the upi and connecting all the banks and connecting everything together is i think just phenomenal now these new age entrepreneurs are coming and building their businesses on top of this infrastructure right so i'll give you an example during covid one of my friends started you know sitting at home what do you do small enterprise of making sushis and selling it and how did how was that achieved she started to market it on instagram so you have social media through which you were propagating your service payments used to be zip through google pay so you, there was no physical contact so customers could pay you online and hyper local delivery guys would go and you know pick up and deliver it to wherever was this even possible 5 years ago 
can you conceptualize that you know that you could propagate a business online you could deliver because there is hyper logistics the food tech companies and everybody has developed this infrastructure to you know zip now medis you know domino started by delivering pizzas within 30 minutes right now you could get groceries medicines within 30 minutes delivered to your house and payments made online so there is no hassle i mean this is a revolution right so now you have these indian entrepreneurs we never had the ecosystem like silicon valley today we have a fantastic ecosystem right see the amount of money that is pouring into our startup ecosystem the venture capital private equity industry is just pouring in money so suddenly you have unshackled the entrepreneurial spirit of this country capital is available there is less friction of doing business there is still friction if doing business you know we still have to traverse uh, a long distance in terms of ease of doing business but it's all coming down right you can set up a company in one day now you can you know you can zip payments you can everything is online i think in the next 4 5 years as we even crunch the time taken to start a business i think risk capital is available indians are naturally very good at technology we've been we created a massive it services 200 billion dollar industry servicing the fortune 500 and the fortune 1000 companies building their networks building their software running their applications putting their data on the cloud we can do it for ourselves now we we have the native capability and the beauty is that the britishers left us with the english language which is the language of the internet right so i think the soft digital infrastructure the availability of risk capital with the kind of liquidity that is sloshing around in the world i think we have unlocked the spirit of the domestic entrepreneurs which will now create lot of wealth going forward from here and i think that's going to start a new cycle which which is to my mind going to be very very exciting right we used to only think oh look at the number of ceos uh, indian born ceos in in america right why because inherently we were great managers great entrepreneurs if we got the right environment like people got in the us or anywhere else in the world indians and nris have done so well now india is going to give them the platform to do that they don't have to go abroad to do it you can do it here in india and that will create a virtuous cycle of wealth creation risk taking uh you know an entrepreneurship and that's why i'm so bullish about india for the next 10 years i think india's time has come every which way you look at it top down macro 2000 dollar per capita you know that's when countries really sprint in terms of growth risk capital again india was always a capital scarce economy now you have so much of capital which is available and people are willing to take that risk and we creating that ecosystem Yeah, and then government also supporting with those PLI schemes and all. Uh, yeah, and the government that, is now supporting, right? I mean, uh, Mr. Modi is the biggest uh, votary of the startup economy. Yeah, yeah, he yeah. thinks India's problems will not be solved by the fattened conglomerates who have been sitting on, uh, <laughs> you know, uh, whatever it is. It is That the is new true. entrepreneurs who are going to solve India's problem. Yeah, good. Uh, before i move on to new age tech and we will come to that in a little bit more detail i just want to understand so next 10 years great i mean you know great story in india government also helping what are the three four sectors you know you guys are more bullish on i think you mentioned one capex probably but uh, you know yeah go on yeah i mean capex but again i think uh, this cycle of capex will be very different right so uh, so traditionally in india when capex used to happen you know people were building thermal power plants mm-hmm. and you know telecom and mining so maybe some of those traditional industries will still grow but i think what is growing now is renewable energy what is capex is happening in electric vehicle infrastructure capex is happening in green energy um automation robotics right so i think the kind of i think capex will do well but i think the kind of capex that will happen in india is going to be very different right um 
and uh, uh, but yes i think we still have a lot of physical stuff to do in this country we have to build more airports and more roads and more dams and more bridges and stuff like that um so i think that the 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 capex cycle over the next 10 years will certainly do well i think um you know a lot of the uh, uh, i think a tech will continue to i think tech is in a super cycle in india because if the if if the whole world is going to spend on technology then i think it services companies will do well in india and the thing is that you know uh, for all that america may say build uh, you know uh, build in america but they just don't have people and they've stimulated their economies by giving free checks nobody wants to work because everybody has made money on the nasdaq and snp and bitcoin that they don't want to work so who's going to do all the hard work i think it's the indians which are going to do the hard work right so i think tech is in a super cycle in india so that's one sector that i'm bullish on broadly financial services will also do well because india is so under penetrated on credit but in my view there will be new there will be leadership change in financial services because the the barbarians are at gate right the fintechs and there is this big debate whether the fintechs and the banks will coexist yes i think you will see a new animal right so you will see a cross between a zebra and a horse or something like that which will be a very agile uh you know digital savvy uh financial services companies uh, you know uh, it will take time because the existing banks have the rbi's handles on them uh but you can't change the march of technology and already i am seeing the pressure on uh, some of the existing well established banks like hdfc and kotak who are struggling to match up in this new environment and you are seeing new leaders like bajaj and icici bank who are you know uh, who are uh, coasting past and you can see that in the markets as well right yeah. uh, how uh, how hdfc and kotak have underperformed while bajaj and icici have outperformed in the last 18 months the market's very smart they are derating those and they are re-rating these companies right so uh, i think financial services will do very well but it's going to be a very different kind of a landscape 10 years out down the line so you have to have to be very uh, very very conscious of which kind of companies you are betting on uh, in financial services uh, i think manufacturing is going to make a big comeback and i've said this i think we're going to see a manufacturing renaissance in this country uh, for a couple of reasons one i mentioned the china plus one strategy the rewiring of global supply chains but i think also the the you know i mentioned about this little bit of deglobalization right i mean and i use this example and then it opens up people's eyes covid just imagine in a country like india if we did not have the capability to manufacture our own vaccines yeah this country would have been up shit creek just imagine trying to vaccinate 1.3 billion people with imported vaccines unbelievable the cost and just the availability because would pfizer or somebody else they would have first said you know first vaccinate america then we will vaccinate then we will export to other countries right the reason why some of the southeast asian countries kept falling back is because they were only they were all dependent on chinese vaccines i mean we have to thank our pharmaceutical industry that we have the ability that we were able to develop and manufacture our own vaccines right and i think covid has opened up the eyes of the government and the regulators and even the countries the boss there is some critical things that you need to be self sufficient about because we stretched globalization to the other side of the pendulum just in time single supplier around the world all of that became very fragile during covid you can't have just in time if you don't have any inventory left you are helter skelter you know because things were shut down because of the pandemic nobody had planned that something like this could happen so i think there is a little bit of that deglobalization or what you would call you know make your own stuff at least that is critical secondly i think because also india is a large market so i think 
you know, uh, 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 it makes now sense to manufacture in India. Why should, I mean, you're an Indian, right? I mean, if you think of it, if you pay holy, the pichkari you use used to come from China. You burst crackers in Diwali made in China. Come on. I mean, I'm not anti-globalized. I'm, I'm pro-globalization. But I'm saying that, you know, I think we took the concept too far to the other side of the pendulum. And I think the pendulum is going to swing back. So I think there is going to be a manufacturing renaissance in this country. There is now a thinking. Look at semiconductors. I mean, suddenly the whole global auto industry is thinking there are only four large global semiconductor manufacturers. Everybody is helter skelter. Now Tata's have said, screw it. I'm going to manif- I'm going to set up my own manif- uh, semiconductor plant, right? And Indians are good at it. I give this example, nowhere in the world, cement companies have their own power plants. But in India, every cement company has a captive power plant. Why? Because the government never gave them adequate, uh, uninterrupted, low-cost power. So every cement company said, Chodo, main apna khud ka power plant. Hmm. Infosys had its own uh, 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 you know, uh, uh, education institute in Mysore where they took fresh engineers, retrained them, and then put them on the job. Because our education system could not create those engineers with those skill sets. So in India, our mindset and our entrepreneurs are so used to backward integration. If something doesn't get anything, then I will make myself. If it doesn't power, I will make myself power. Right? But I think all of these factors of supply chain, geopolitics, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, I think manufacturing is going to make a big comeback in India. And I was thinking about specialty chemicals, right? The stuff which is uh, which is polluting to make. And I was thinking if after China, who else? Americans have, don't have the capabilities to do that anymore now, right? The Europeans are the ones which had all the technology, but they are the ones which are moving the fastest on the ESG scale. So they don't want to make all of this in Europe anymore. The Southeast Asians don't have the chemistry skills to do it. I don't think an Indonesia or a Thailand or a Vietnam or a Bangladesh can make, uh, you know, fluorine molecules because India has the capability to do that. There is no other country, right? So I think some of it is going to fall into India's lap. Uh, And I think we are going to see, and therefore I think manufacturing as a sector will do very well. Now this, you can split it across several, whether it is, APIs in pharma or specialty chemicals or auto components or, you know, whatever you call it, right? I think uh, in uh, manufacturing will do very well. And then I think the new age companies, uh, you know, the, the, the tech enabled every industry, whatever you call it, whether it is the retail industry, whether it is whatever. And uh, so I think that we are betting on some of these you know, the players in some, some of this is still hazy, but I think as time goes by, we will see a lot of players and a lot of fresh blood coming in, uh, you know, and uh, we will have some very interesting stocks to bet on and companies to bet on. Yeah, that's a good, let's uh, let's have a good segue into the new age tech company, uh, since that's, that's the, you know, uh, you spoke about that. Uh, now we have seen some of the new age companies getting listed in India, but you know, unfortunately, some of them have like you know dropped a lot as well. Uh, globally, tech companies are going through a drawdown as high as 70, 80 percent, right? Pelotons of the world, even Zoom. I mean, Zoom is like back to pre-pandemic level. So, how do you? I mean, a you know, how do you look at that situation where you know tech has seen a drawdown right now, and including companies listed in India? and a long-term view on, on that sector? Um, so I think, you know, it's the, the new age tech is interesting because, you know, disruption causes three things. It produces new winners. There are some losers and there are some completely new players, right? And it all plays out very differently in every sector. So you will have to kind of take a sector by sector view, right? 
you mentioned about zoom very interesting uh, you know that uh, you know zoom did very well and now it's actually back to pre pandemic levels and after we uh, you know uh, uh, and and then i was discussing this with uh, some of my friends who uh, run global tech funds and you know was trying to say hey what happened here even though the revenue is up two and a half times and profits are up he said well i mean yes zoom did well and uh, you know partly it could be also because you know these retail investors come in and they go in and go out in in swathes but also uh microsoft came up with teams right some of the existing players came back very strongly with similar offerings and uh, which is a great example of how uh existing incumbents can come back and adapt to a disruption and come back with a, a very good service right so if i am a microsoft exchange uh, you know if i am if my company is running on microsoft then uh, you know i will uh, i'm initially maybe during the lockdown i might have used zoom and i will still continue to use zoom but then you know uh, all my secure communication within the organization i might move to uh, move to uh, microsoft teams right so people adapt and fight back right um so i think that it's quite interesting because and i use this example in india which is you know people generally when they talk they talk about very high tech things but i use a very low tech example so when patanjali came couple of years ago right it created a massive flutter amongst the fmcg companies so suddenly he came on the platform of you know indian and ayurvedic and natural ingredients and you know these guys are using chemicals and they are mncs and i'm not taking an ideological stand but they, he created a massive disruption in the in the fmcg industry right and if you look at it at when 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 the patanjali fever was at its peak all the fmcg stocks derated they didn't do anything everything corrected right so here came a disruptor came took away some part of the market share in certain categories in honey for example in toothpaste right in many categories he took away ghee he took away some market share uh, from the existing players and now created a 10 12000 crore top line business right now many incumbents then went back to the drawing board and adapted and they fought back right so every single toothpaste company came up with a ayurvedic variant of the toothpaste so it forced the existing guys to adapt right now today nobody talks about patanjali but now you know they've acquired ruchi and they will go ipo but i'm just saying that it's quite interesting that uh you know it depends so when uh, initially my view is that when when disruption hits right there is a first phase where there is there is underperformance in that sector because visibility is completely gone you don't know how much disruption the new guy is going to cause right and how much time will it take for the incumbents to fight back and adapt right so i think in every sector we are taking a, you know when you look at new age so you sit back and say okay so what is nike trying to do right so you know he's lakme has been around for like years together trying to sell uh, you know uh, beauty products in india but here comes a platform which aggregates so many brands at various price points and makes it very easy to the customer and then they created a ecosystem whereby you know through social media influencing and you know uh, and they started to engage with the uh, younger audience and demographics uh, and suddenly created a business out of that right so i think that uh, but in the case of nike they had an established business model which was making money but they just did it by aggregating on a platform rather than a vertical product company so what is happening in many industries that you have these vertical players but now you have these platform companies who are coming and aggregating a lot of stuff on the platform and are it's becoming very easy for them to reach the customer 
I mean, if you look at the history of the levers and the Colgates and the ITCs of the world, they've spent decades and decades building arduous distribution network, going down to the smallest village with 50,000 population and then doing innovation on products, packets, and, you know, one rupee and small size packs to reach there. They really did some innovation. But now, with the digital infrastructure, I can immediately, if I have a great product and a platform, and I can get so many users onto my platform, I can deliver a product, a lipstick to anybody in Jumri Talaya, for all you know, right? And that's new competition. And it has come in the, na in the last five years. Right. So I think that in every industry, you will have to sit and understand the dynamics uh, because there is no one answer that I can give you. So I'm not going to bet on a new age company just because it is new age. Right. Uh, you know, what's the competitive advantage they have got? Do they have unit economics? Will they make money? Uh, and what is the ability of the incumbents to fight back you know are they very sloppy uh, like in telecom you know that your that your competition was a psu so you know you could be rest assured that they are not fighting back right <laughs> uh, so i think uh, it is very interesting and uh, uh, the beauty is because now a little bit it has become easy because i think there are some existing models that investors can study Right. So when when uh, when Zomato came, people quickly started and learned about what did DoorDash do or what did Mithwan do. Right. And they could they could do some comparatives and, and come to some understanding. Right. Um, so to that extent, today, you know, because knowledge is so easily transferable and you have access to so much of data, I think to some extent there is an ability to judge whether you are overpaying, underpaying, whether this model works, what happened there. And then you Indianize that model and say, okay, I mean, like, you know, itna arpu milega, will the guy be in India be willing to pay for a service like this? Uh, you know, and then you come down to Indian demographics and it's not a one-to-one -one comparison, but you at least get some framework to evaluate a business, right? Um so I think that the way we are looking at it is that uh, the, the other thing is that right now there is, because there is a paucity of these new age companies and there is tremendous interest amongst retail investors and high net worth investors to be part of that uh, conversation, right? So the family offices, I mean, we manage money for a lot of them. You know, they, they all want to in the evening, this, uh, you know, the, they all want to sit in their clubs and say, oh, you know, I invested in this company and I did the series C round of this company and this is looking, I mean, you know, there is a lot of excitement around investing in the private markets today. But my view is that, uh, you know, I say that the temple of capitalism is the stock market. So eventually all these guys will have to come here to list because your ESOPs are worthless if you are not a listed company, yeah. right? So when they come to the equity markets, the rules of the game are different. It's like this, when you enter the jungle, the rules of the jungle apply, right? Yeah. So I think when you enter the stock market, then people talk about visibility, then they talk about profitability, then they talk about unit economics, then they talk about sustainability. And that is something we've done for 30 years. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, uh, uh, it is very similar. I find it very similar because, you know, many of the very good, but, you know, investors who never understood a software company karta kya hai, because it was never very tangible of what they were doing right and a lot of people missed investing in infosys and some of these software companies right because they just couldn't understand now i think there is far more understanding because of availability of data and a lot of analysis uh, is accessible but i still believe that uh, you know, it is going to be very tricky, but at the same time, very interesting to bet on some of these companies. So, you know, we, the, the, the approach we are taking is that we are, we are definitely very deeply studying each and each of these companies that are coming in. And if we can understand 
then we will invest if we can't it's okay we'll take our time because when we look back at the history of some of these companies new age so called tech giants in the us where everybody has made a lot of money we found that you could buy these companies at various points in time in the market when they were listed right markets always gives you opportunities yeah when you are in the private market you feel the feeling of left uh, being left because how will i get access to the deal you know mujhe kaise deal milega will i be able to participate it's all a very closed club and community that all gets broken once you come to the listed markets nobody can stop me from buying zomato or 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 buying a paytm now right i don't need to go and suck up to the banker or you know find out somebody to do it right i will evaluate at my time at my valuation and i will buy it. and i think that's why i'm so not so worried but i think it's going to be exciting the universe is going to uh, you know is going to explode and uh, just like i utilized my understanding by starting a pms strategy of investing in uh, you know taking very concentrated bets 10 stock portfolios we started what uh, this uh, a fund called alchemy leaders of tomorrow where we want to bet on some of these disruptive companies or we want to bet on disruption beneficiaries right so for example we invested in a software company called tata lx right which is the best performing tech stock from the covid lows and the best performing tata group company and what they do they basically uh you know sub, uh, develop software for all these oems who are now struggling and you know who are now uh, wanting to get into the ev game right so whether it's mercedes benz or bmw or ford or everybody wants to go all electric and they all have to start putting a lot of software into their cars and the traditional car companies only understand mechanical they don't understand software so then they go to indian companies and uh, you know uh, so i here is a classic case of you know i may not be able to buy a tesla but that's okay mm. uh, you know uh, tata lx is up 12x from the uh, you know in the last uh, 18 months i could make money in tata lx there's a smart way to play we invested in map my india right it's just like betting on google maps right yeah. i think there is an explosion of geospatial content and uh, you know i can make money by investing in uh, in, uh, in in map my india we in that in that fund we invested in saregama because there is you know explosion in digital distribution of music right i can't buy a spotify sitting here maybe i can if you know through the 250000 dollars that i'm allowed to invest out but there are smarter ways to play some of these uh, what i call as the new digital trends uh and the new disruptions uh sitting in india in the listed universe you just have to think differently you have to research differently and uh, you know uh, uh that's what uh, we want to do now uh, you know to capture uh, the imagination and i tell investors that the world is changing the way business is doing but your portfolios are not changing you're still sitting on your old friend you know high quality franchises but the leaders of tomorrow may not necessarily be the leaders of the previous cycle yeah interesting uh you know we are also entering into a very interesting macro environment as well right we fed you know going to raise rates four times this year uh, another four next year probably at least the market is saying that fed will take the rate up to 175 very clearly rbi will surely follow fed i mean not just about falling but rbi will also have to raise rates because the rates are at very historical low in india as well and we we are seeing some impact of that in us market especially in the tech space so do you look at macro in picture for deciding on your portfolio and if so how you guys take that into account yeah i think uh, as i tell people that you have to be macro aware you know the you, you need to have that context uh with you in terms of what is happening globally and uh we all did not even realize in 2008 9 when the market snapped back that what 
quantitative easing was. It was a new yeah. thing for us, right? Yeah. Now we know uh, what happens when central banks around the world uh, increase their balance sheet and start printing money and you know start stimulating the economy. Um, again, I am not a global expert, but I think one thing is for sure that you know interest rates are going up. There is no two doubts about it. We can all debate whether it's three hikes, four hikes. And I think what's happening right now is that the market is adjusting to that new reality. It's trying to price in the higher interest rates. Um, and I think what usually happens is that, uh, you know, uh, stocks which are purely built on some concept, uh, you know, or where near-term profitability is not in sight and the valuations were bid up. I think those kind of companies will definitely see an impact on their valuations as interest rates rise and there is some incremental tightening that happens globally. Right? But you know, I think at a, at a much broader level, my, <clears throat> my view is that uh, that's not going to stop, uh, you know, that may, that may alter a little bit of how you value companies and how much uh, tangibility do you want to attach to the businesses that you invest in, right? Um, having said that, I still believe that, you know, it's going to be very difficult for global central banks to significantly wind down liquidity. So if you see the what happened post the global financial crisis, right, from 2 trillion, the Fed increased the, the balance sheet size to 4.5 trillion. And then they could only scale back a little bit and then it remained stagnant till COVID happened and then they ballooned the balance sheet to 8 or 10 trillion. Now you are again faced with the same dilemma where you will be able to dial back a little bit but the absolute liquidity will, to my mind, be at a new high than what it was pre-pandemic. At the margin, it will contract. And I think when that happens in 2022, or I don't know, sometimes timing, all of this is not very easy, but let's say over the next 12, 24 months, um, you will have various speculative assets, speculative companies, the so-called very high-value tech companies correcting uh, you know, uh, very sharply. And focus will go back to profitability, unit economics, cash flow. And the fastest that the companies are able to reach that goal, uh, the more sustainable will be, uh, you know, their valuations. So I think it is, you know, uh, it's not that the tide will lift all boats anymore in my opinion. So it's not going from a macro perspective, it's not going to be a very easy environment. Uh, so the markets will try to price it in. But I don't think that it is going to create too much of a upheaval, right? I mean, it's no longer, if I and you are discussing how many rate hikes have happened, the markets are, as we speak, are already starting to price in uh, that, right? But having said that, I'm, I mean, at, at, a, at a more uh, longer term level, uh, you know, I continue to be very, very constructive. Uh, and uh, the other thing is that, uh, uh, you know, it is, uh, you know, I, the only change we are making, as I said, is that uh, you, you just make your entry pricing a little more tighter, uh, you know, keeping that context in mind that, or you, you build up your position over a period of time. You don't need to go all in at one shot, uh, you know, because the markets will keep giving you chances along the way, right? So, uh, so I think it's just more tactical portfolio management, but structurally, we continue to be very bullish. Okay, awesome. So you've been in the uh, business of uh, money management for long. And, you know, if you were to write a book for new investors, what will you write in that? <laughs> well, I already actually uh, have, if I've not written a book, but I was featured in, in, in this book, Masterclass with Super Investors um, by Vishal and Saurabh. And I 
whatever we spoke a lot of that and my learnings are already there in that but you know my uh, what i would tell new investors is that uh, you know investing is 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 a very very long journey and and more than money it's the aptitude which is required right yeah um people spend disproportionate amount of time trying to time markets i'm not saying that timing the market is wrong right but i'm saying don't spend disproportionate period of time uh, trying to figure out these things because you won't be able to figure out yeah. right um and the best thing for individual investors or new investors is that you know take the plunge and i always tell them that you can't learn swimming by reading a swimming manual you have to get into the water <laughs> right uh, so so get in and uh, you know market is a big teacher uh, market teaches you everything absolutely uh, and uh, i think uh, have patience uh, have a long term view and don't try to copy anybody else's conviction build your own conviction i mean either you do that if you want to invest by yourself or then give it to somebody who you believe has the conviction to do the right things because i have never seen any investor i mean i've seen so many investors who are very cerebral they will try to talk to 10 managers and 10 intelligent investors and the problem is that they don't build their own conviction mm. they are trying to invest on somebody else's conviction now i may have a different conviction you will have a different conviction right but ultimately uh, you know this is a lonely business you have to yes. you have to pull the trigger and you have to build your own conviction and that's when the journey will become interesting and rewarding yeah you know they say right you 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 can uh, copy somebody's conviction but you can't copy the risk appetite you, the risk appetite is yours and and that determines Absolutely. more your portfolio than your conviction on any particular thing yeah i you know just today i had a a client of mine who walked in and uh, you know without giving names or numbers and he said you know i have several hundreds not hundred in thousands of crores portfolio and then he was saying oh you have this and then he's telling his uh, uh, you know a son what price did we buy it at oh you know i had so many shares and i sold it during covid right i mean he got scared and he sold it and yeah. i said look it's you know uh, his risk taking capacity his corpus is very big but he doesn't have the aptitude Mm-hmm. i said you know this is uh, you know when you buy a piece of land or real estate you are willing to give it 5 10 years you don't buy it for 6 months yeah you know you don't even look at the price i said the damn problem with the with equities as an asset class is because there is a ticker every day and that plays on your mind right uh, you know and how you get used to the the uh, and how you can differentiate between temporary loss of value versus permanent loss of capital these are two different things absolutely so i told him if you buy a shitty stock at 100 and which goes down to 20 and never comes back to 100 that's permanent loss of capital yeah but if you buy something at 100 and it goes to 50 eventually if it's a good company it'll come back to 100 at some point right so that's a temporary loss of value but if you can't relate to that concept you will never become an investor in equities You no, keep flip flopping. Yeah, absolutely true. Absolutely, and we have seen so many people in COVID time, you know, selling out all of their portfolio in panic, and never got into the market again. They so, never, never got yeah. into the market. I agree. Yeah. yeah, you know, our show is called uh, Breaking Investment Stereotypes. So, any uh, investment stereotypes you want to talk about, you know, which comes to your mind? Yeah, I think uh, uh, you know one stereotype. which i said is that uh, uh, you know don't over diversify yeah because uh, you know concentration does not increase risk if you know what you are doing in fact concentration is your friend right so you want to bet uh, many times people have said this uh, oh this stock in my portfolio has done phenomenally well agar main sab paisa isi mein dal deta to Now, obviously you don't get into that level of uh, extreme concentration 
but i'm just saying in general uh my sense is that uh, you know don't over diversify break that stereotype that you know diversification reduces my risk yeah. it doesn't and i keep telling clients that you know just because you give manager uh, every you know money to five managers you've reduced your risk and those each of those five managers then buy 25 stocks so you basically pay active fees for buying an etf uh, a 100 stock etf right yeah. i mean just no, think yeah. of it when they think of it when i tell them like that they feel they feel so stupid right that i'm paying active fees to five managers mm. uh, to diversify my risk but when you add it up all right at some point in the cycle somebody will do very well somebody will do average somebody will do shitty i say is the average of everything is an average you can't take most, two donkeys mostly below and merge them and mostly yeah. below average i mean you can't take, yeah you 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 know uh, uh, <laughs> you you can't take two donkeys and make a horse out of it yeah yeah you know interesting you know on our app uh, one guy mentioned that you know i have invested in 10 small cases i said you know when you have invested in 10 small cases i don't know what you invested in <laughs> because very highly likely <laughs> you know, there are 50 100 stocks in that and, and i don't know what to make yeah. of that yeah absolutely yeah yeah uh, so what, what you know i'm sure you you read a lot what do you read or watch beyond equities in the markets uh reading is uh, you know i i read uh, uh, i read mostly non fiction mm-hmm. but i read everything from spirituality to healthcare to investing to economics to entrepreneurship um i mean there is a wide range mm-hmm. of you know science uh, physics i mean everything right uh, so when i when i when when it hit me these last few years that you know there is so much of disruption in technology i signed up for things like the mit technology review and i read that regularly just to keep myself up it may not have any immediate uh, uh, you know uh, but i always feel that your uh, you know as an investor uh, you have to keep filling your subconscious mind with uh, uh, you know with with lot of new information and patterns and that when you are actively in your conscious mind when you are thinking that does, you know when that information jumps from your subconscious to your conscious mind you do not know right yeah. so uh, uh, so i think just one of the things is that i i read a wide variety of subjects uh, and i don't know how finally at some point in time at some point something clicks and fuses uh, uh, with you right and uh, uh, you know i give this example because i was reading a book on hr and uh, i sometimes give this example to people uh, when they tell me that you know how do you take bets i said well you know i may think that i have done all the research on a company before investing but my experience tells you that all the research that i think i have done as a smart fund manager is only 20% 80% of the knowledge comes after i have invested in a stock and i say that's like hiring an employee what do you do when you hire an employee he sends you a cv so you read his entire history geography what he has studied where he has worked what his experience what his interest is that's like me reading the annual report and the earnings transcript of a company right then what do you do you call the guy for an interview and you do two three rounds of interview so you question him right that's like me interviewing the management or the cfo of a company asking a lot of questions trying to get more information more understanding and insight then what do you do then investors do what is called as channel checks so they talk to a competitor a customer a supplier and you know you try to get an outside in perspective that's what you do when a candidate gives you some references so you call up somebody and say hey have you worked with the guy what do you think of that person so and so so you do your reference check and then you think you know the person very well so you hire the person well the fun starts after you hire the yeah. person right when he or she starts working for you day in and day out in different context under pressure when things are good when things are bad that's when you know the real character of a person the same is it with a company 
I think I have done all the research in the world before I buy the company. I think it's all bullshit. Mm. I think I know nothing about a company unless I invest in a company and then I watch it and I ruminate and I think because that's when real life situations come and how what happens to the company how do how does the management react what did they do all of that then you build a picture and then you build conviction and then i say then i really bet big but you know i think that that is something uh, and, and that's why i read profusely because you never know how the synthesis of information which is built over years when and in what context it will help you so yeah i mean just very varied uh, forms of uh, you know things of reading so we're coming to the to, to the end of our conversation uh, this is one thing we ask every guest so what advice will you give to your 20 year old self uh save and invest yeah don't spend because you are hurting your power of compounding true the early you start the journey the more profitable it is going to be right so by the time you stop working your money is working so hard for you that you know you can easily retire and do nothing but if you only start about investing after you know uh, you have reached 40 or 50 well it's not bad but the later you start the less the advantage of compound true so in our family for example when a newborn is born mm. right we don't gift money we gift stocks because you know that that person has an 18 year runway yeah that's long term investing and 18 years of compounding by the time they become a major and they are out in the big bad world of you know higher education they've already created a pot of money and simple things every birthday every occasion when somebody gives you 500 rupees 1000 rupees 50000 whatever it is mm. collect everything and invest and keep investing with a very long term it has worked wonders yeah so uh, let me ask you that what was the last talk you gave to your newborn <laughs> <laughs> i i i uh, i i gave tata alexi to okay. my niece okay awesome uh, on, on that note uh, thanks a lot hiren i it was wonderful didn't realize that you know we've been speaking for more than uh, hour and a half now and so and i can go on frankly uh for for many hours as well so probably we'll have a version 2 of this uh but thanks a lot uh, for coming on on to our podcast and you know really enjoyed the conversation no really thanks a lot raj it was it was equally a pleasure and uh, we will certainly catch up again thank you